So we have Lake County State's Attorney, Eric Reinhardt. Uh, he is a newly elected Lake County State Attorney to office in December 2020. Eric has made on the agenda of reform and restorative justice. Eric believes that we can make our community safer and our courthouse fairer by treating the long term causes of crime, serving as the voice of all victims, and by intentionally working to end systemic racism. Um, I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll skip to the good part. So very excited to hear um, what he sort of has to say on this gun violence prevention initiative. Um, and then I will also introduce Sarah Kanijnik. Um, Sarah served as chair of the gun violence prevention initiative at the Lake County State's Attorney's Office. In November 2022, she was elected to the Lake County Board representing District 15, which includes Vernon Hills, Buffalo Grove, Hawthorne North, Hilldeer, Long Grove, and Lake Dirt. And just a little fun fact, when I first moved to Chicago, Sarah is actually one of the first people I met in a political event. And it's so great that, you know, we can have her come and speak because I feel like, you know, my, my journey in politics in Chicago and her journey in you know, politics in her area, um, we both had quite, quite a journey. And so it's nice when, like, the road sort of intersect. And with that in mind, I will have our speakers come up and get started with the program. You want to share the screen? Yeah, you want to share the presentation. Yeah, you want to share the presentation. People hear me. It's okay to chat. I can see the chat. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Eric Weinhardt. I'm the Lake County State's Attorney. Very excited to be here tonight. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the Beauty League Club for a beautiful, beautiful venue and for uh, asking Sarah and I. Uh, to appear today to talk about what we are doing in uh, Lake County. Uh, before we go any further, though, I said just to make sure that everyone knows we get a lot more applause for Assistant Secretary uh, Chris Patterson of the Illinois Department of Transportation. Chris heads up the Governor's uh, Office of Fire and Violence Prevention. That office was founded in 2021. Is that right? Uh, in 2021 to get a statewide approach to how we can address gun violence. Uh, I don't want to speak for Sarah, I don't want to speak for myself. Uh, I learned a such an amazing amount uh, from uh, Secretary Patterson, and he has taught me a lot about this, and I'm not going to claim to be a subject matter expert when it comes to uh, some of the work that needs to be done in a lot of uh, a lot of underrepresented, a lot of underserved communities, but I will uh, be very happy to talk about what is the work that you can do at the courthouse, what is the work that you can do at the prosecutor's office uh, to address the root causes of nonviolence, and at the end of the day, save lives, and and that's the goal. That's the goal of all of this work. So um, I just want to make sure that uh, the that, that Secretary Patterson uh, uh, was acknowledged because of the amazing leader that he is. Um, Sarah, do you want to say just a little bit? I said, got a nice introduction, but I don't want to say just a little bit. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'll add a little bit um, as relevant to uh, the remarks that Eric just shared. Uh, I got started in violence prevention about well, seven years ago, and one of the first people that I met. He taught me so much about why we have a and how important it is to center. To focus our efforts on ending gun violence. Uh, and uh, I am a former um, English teacher that I went to the on silos countries and between cultures. And so um, I really desperately have wanted to see communities, communities that are underserved come together to try to address the gun violence crisis as one. Because what's really important to realize is that we don't have many. We have one very complex problem. The root causes of gun violence, a primary one is inequities in the criminal justice system, which is why I so 
was so happy <laughs> to have Eric Reinhardt elected as my state's attorney because he is a true reformer and he was all ears when I approached him years ago while he was still on the campaign trail about how we need to have an office of violence prevention and a prosecutor's office because we need that that way we can integrate our violence prevention efforts both to prevent um, violence before it happens, uh, but also um, to address its primary root cause, which is that's pretty much what we're going to talk about here tonight. And um, you'll hear this again, but I can't say it enough. We're one of only three offices of violence prevention in the entire United States that are housed in a prosecutor's office. So we couldn't be prouder and we're thrilled to be here to tell you about it. And with that, I'm going to let Eric get the slide presentation started. All right, Sarah and I will try to negotiate the microphone here. Um, but uh, let's see, we can, hopefully this works. Now, can I get next slide maybe? Yeah, did it go? No. That's, that's okay, we just say next slide, I guess. Ah, here we go. Um, so as Sarah said, you know, the, the, the goal of the Gun Violence Prevention Initiative uh, is to address the acute problems of everyday gun violence while also uh, addressing the inequities in the criminal justice system. As Sarah said, obviously we're a prosecutor's office uh, that is accepting the responsibility of this. I, I don't think there's anything uh, that a prosecutor's office or really government is supposed to be doing other than making, uh, making people safe. So the goal of this initiative is to think very long term about that. And I think that the, I think that the elected state's attorney of every county in Illinois should be looking at addressing the root causes. I got to be honest, that is a reform. Uh, it's sad for me to have to tell you that I had a, a, I've had I've heard prosecutors say, "Are we really here to address root causes?" Of course we are, because we're here to make people safer. And so that is the 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 innovation of the the gun violence prevention initiative. Um, I'm agnostic uh, as to uh, whether it should be in a health department, whether it should be in a mayor's office, uh, whether it could be in different locations. But obviously, we are not agnostic about whether we should have one in Lake County. And what Sarah and I said was, we have to have one in Lake County. And frankly, the influence that Sarah and I could have was in the prosecutor's office. Because unlike Chicago, uh, where the mayor, uh, where the mayor's office is obviously, you know, with the city, the city is relatively, uh, you know, relatively uh, the same space that we were talking about for preventing gun violence, though we always have the suburbs in Cook. It's the, we have 43 different cities in Lake County. We have 43 different police municipalities. We have 43 sets of rules, 43 mayors, 43 boards governing those towns. So the state's attorney's office is a natural place for it, not only because in Lake County, we needed a, a, centrifying, uh, a, 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 a centrifying force, uh, a centralizing force, excuse me, uh, a centralizing force, but also because of the work we can do with restorative justice. Because one of the things that frankly Sarah taught me was that the inequities in the justice system, the things we are not doing for restorative justice are driving instability in our communities. They are driving instabilities in our communities of color. And those instabilities throughout any place will drive up crime. And so if a prosecutor's office is not at the forefront of this fight, if the prosecutor's office is not at the forefront of thinking intentionally about this, uh, then I think we are missing an opportunity uh, to connect restorative justice ideals with with this fight. So um, that's really why you have these, that's why you have all of these ideas put together. You have the sort of traditional uh, CVI work. It's traditional, right? I'm saying traditional because it's been around for a little while, uh, but you have the CVI work, but you also have what those, um, what those credible messengers can say to a prosecutor's office about restorative justice and how they can advocate maybe for a young man to get a restorative justice approach. Can one of our caseworkers make sure that we get an expungement? Can a caseworker make sure uh, that we get uh, somebody maybe a, a break with a prosecutor? That's one of the ideas of, of our particular brand uh, of violence prevention work. But also, it just so happens that the state's attorney's office is one of the centralizing forces in community-based organizations. That may not be true in another county in Illinois, uh, but it is true in Lake County. It's one of the things that Sarah and I saw. Lake County is very... Uh, fortunate to have so many fantastic CBOs. And there already was some centralizing around the prosecutor's office for a lot of reasons. Uh, and, and so that is another benefit of Lake County. And I think that's one of the good things about having it in our prosecutor's office. 
Oh, next slide, maybe? Or do you want to talk about Yeah, this? I think um, next slide. I just, before we go, I'm sorry, <laughs> I misspoke. Back real quick. So there are sort of three main components to what we're trying to do. And you'll see we've got it in graph form that we're going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, but it's really um, three-pronged approach. So supporting community violence interruption, we're going to go to, into detail about that program in a few minutes. Uh, but it's very uh, important to realize we recognize that a state's attorney's office is an elected position. And we do not want our community violence interruption program in Lake County to be at the whim of the electorate, right? So if uh, the next state's attorney who holds this office happens to be opposed to the idea of community violence interruption, then we want to make sure that that program will live on uh, beyond um, Secretary or State's Attorney Reinhardt's um, tenure. So um, we'll explain in a few minutes how we made that work. Uh, the CVI program does not work for us. It's not under our administration but we did secure the funding for them. So one of the things that I noticed um, from what I learned uh, and experiences I had watching uh, my friends that are violence professionals, violence prevention professionals in Cook County is that uh, for the last many years, they've had plenty of access to private funding, now public funding. But um, when they started uh, sort of revamping the whole ceasefire model, uh, they had a lot of private funding that the folks I knew doing this work in Lake County had absolutely no access to. And I knew that the folks I knew I know in Lake County who are doing violence prevention work did not have the bandwidth to be able to secure their own private or public funding. They were too busy saving lives to fill out grant applications. Uh, so what I realized is that um, you know the community violence interruption professionals they you know they didn't have they didn't have organizations that were officially professional organizations, but they were doing the same work. Uh, as professional community violence interrupters. And I just really felt strongly that they deserved to be supported in a similar way to the way these folks in Cook County were being supported. So I thought, well, they probably can't get their funding on their own, but if we had the right state's attorney, he could get the funding for them. And so that's pretty much how we got to where we are today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the amount of funding and how we got it. Um, but, and he, and then Eric pretty well covered the other two like important planks or the other two main planks of what we're doing. Uh, so next slide, please. And this looks like a little more detail about the CVI program. Uh, so we recognize that it's a public health crisis, gun violence, um, and that it's negative effects affect everyone in the county. Uh, however, we're centering the, the work of ending gun violence in our underserved communities. So that's traditionally thought of as Waukegan, North Chicago, Zion. Um, that's the area where we're uh, in the short term focusing our efforts in Lake County, although eventually we hope to expand uh, in the not too distant future to other underserved communities in Lake County. Um, so we're going to, and I'll, when I'll let Eric discuss um, the CVI program and how it's about to get launched and how we chose um, the right administrative body to oversee it. Yeah, so the CVI, the CVI program is the community violence uh, interruption uh, aspect of this. And this is, and I used the phrase credible messengers earlier. This is where we have to make sure that individuals can go out and connect with individuals, primarily youth, but not always, uh, individuals who are at risk themselves of being victims of gun violence or uh, potentially uh, may themselves be uh, involved with, uh, with committing the crime. This is a prevention model. This is a this is a model that says we need to make every connection we can with as many people as we can who are at risk and in risk. Well, we have to identify those people, and we'll sort of have a graphic uh, that will show you that in a moment. But the most important thing for the for the interrupter model is that you have somebody who uh, can connect with people. So you're going to have all types of all types of individuals who say they can do this, but you need the people who are experienced at doing it which means you have to find other experts who can help you find the individuals who can do it. And, and we've hired, uh, uh, the first thing we did was hire our technical assistant uh, to provide us uh, the advice on building this. He's a man by the name Marcus McAllister, who has built these programs, uh, helped build these programs throughout the country. He's not gonna be the director of our program. He sort of helps you build them. He helps you hire the individuals. He has built programs in, uh, helped build programs in New Orleans uh, and many other, Minnesota, Milwaukee, many other locations. And so Marcus McAllister is sort of the, the technical, our technical advisor. That was one of the first pieces we put in place so that we could find uh, a, a program manager and then the individual uh, interrupters. One of the one of the pieces that Marcus and Sarah really, really pushed uh, me on, and it, it, it changed the funding, was that we have to make sure it's professional. We have to make sure that everybody has benefits. 
We have to have insurance. We have to have insurance not only for the work they do when they go out into the streets and, and people's homes and schools. They, have, they, need, they need liability. If they were to get hurt, they have to have insurance, but they also need health insurance themselves just as employees. That part of it, I'll be honest, cost us some time. And as I was speaking to, uh, to Chris Patterson earlier, that's hard, right? Like while Sarah and I and so many other people are building this, people are dying. People are being shot. And so, but we have to build a program that can last decades. We have to build a program that works, but it's hard, right? Like we are in the middle of this crisis. We are in the middle of this public health crisis. And you have to, it is hard to take your time to do the work correctly while these other things are happening around you. And so the CVI part of it, frankly, is the first part that we want to build because we need that community connection quickly. We need that communication. We need that connection quickly. And we have to be able to uh, show that we want to be in, in, in the streets, that we want to be in the schools, that we want to be in the places we need to be. The, the restorative justice part of it, well, heck, prosecutors should always be doing restorative justice, in my opinion. Uh, that's what I ran on before, I, before we had a gun violence prevention initiative. So that part is sort of on me and my prosecutors no matter what, but I think it's great to have this in our office for, for a lot of reasons we'll talk about. And then with respect to the, the community-based organizations, you want to take those interrupters and you want to connect people. We're going to show you a graphic. You want to take people who are at risk and connect them with these CBOs, connect them with the services they need, connect them with government services they may need. Um, anyway, so that's how, the, that's how the interrupter works. Yeah. Right. And I'd like to add a detail to what he just described about how we intend to connect our community violence interrupters with uh, community-based organizations throughout the county that provide the kind of wraparound services that people who are in risk and at risk of gun violence so desperately need. Uh, Cook County, of course, along with some other major cities, has really led the way on this model that we've been describing. And we're really just taking that model and making it work in Lake County. And what that means is our CVI program, uh, it, you know, it's it's newborn, right? <laughs> so um, we know that they don't have the the skills and the, I shouldn't say the skills, they don't have the bandwidth uh, at from right out of the gate, right, to provide wraparound services, like a lot of outstanding organizations that do this work in Cook County do. So we're trying to fill that gap, those of us in the uh, state's attorney's office, our gun violence prevention initiative, and we're trying to uh, make help make those connections for them so that they can concentrate on saving lives. Uh, so I just wanted to add that pretty key piece, I think, because what we realize what, what works for Cook County isn't going to work for Lake County, but what works for Lake County might work for Kane County. And so that's one of the reasons we're so happy to be here tonight uh, is because we, we want to spread the word. Um, our dream is to see offices of violence prevention that integrate efforts to reduce violence with reforms to the criminal justice system in every county in Illinois and even beyond. Uh, so next slide, please. All right. You, well, I, I was, I've been an attorney for 20 years before I was a prosecutor. And whenever it clicked that you got to have, you got to be visual, right? You got to be, got to be visual, uh, whether your words are visual or whether you can get graphics up. So, you know, um, all right. So this is really, um, you know, this really is a schematic uh, of, of how some of these things work uh, on the left. Um, yeah. On the left, you have the, the sort of referral sources into this, into this, um, you know, into this organization. And you see that we, we, we have school outreach and school outreach, you know, it's kind of orange too, right? It's kind of in the interruption model. It's services. Well, you're going to get services in the schools. But, but we added that piece more recently because we're very excited that our, our local regional superintendent, another sort of centralizing force in this, um, also wants to be very involved and can sort of be a, a field operation for us, if you will, in terms of getting the word out uh, into the various schools. Um, the services model is is very important. We uh, I remember speaking to to Eddie Bocanegra and the work he was doing with Ready Chicago. They sort of have a full program graduation model where somebody who we've identified as needing services may uh, spend a certain amount of time uh, and graduate, or we may provide individualized service plans. The point of the services uh, is to make sure that we are thinking about all of the things uh, that people need help with, that people at risk need help with, whether it's job training, whether it's housing, uh, whether it's survivor support. And that's why we've, we've uh, added this trauma-informed practices uh, recently, because we know that so many of the individuals that, that we worry about either being harmed again or maybe committing a crime 
uh, are themselves survivors of gun violence. And it's this this cycle that we are aware of uh, in the you know in the initiative, but obviously that every part of the the work that we do has to be informed by these by these trauma informed uh, practices. So that's going to require training of so many people, but it's also going to require uh, people taking care of themselves too. And the interrupters that are doing this work uh, also have to take care of themselves. My my prosecutors need to take take care of themselves. The people who are in the CBOs need to take care of themselves. The people in the schools need to take care of themselves. Um, and then finally, restorative justice, which is obviously the one of the parts I'm, I'm most passionate about, or I guess the thing I know about, is how do our deflection, diversion, expungement practices, um, how do we how do we make sure that we're eliminating racial disparities? How do we give people hope? Uh, instead of just incarceration or a conviction on their record. Um, I love adding this part. The Safety Act plays in here too. Uh, bail reform and, and, and not incarcerating people because they can't afford it uh, plays into this restorative justice model and making sure that we're not uh, breaking up families, breaking up job opportunities, breaking up schooling um, just because. And, that, and that's really what I try to tell my prosecutors um, is that we have to be so intentional in this work and we have to recognize the damage that we can do. And we, we obviously in a prosecutor's office, you're going to sometimes put people in jail, you're going to put people in prison and that's necessary, but it has to be treated as necessary. And we have to talk about it as necessary. And we can't just hold people on a driving on revoked uh, because they can't post bond. And we can't hold somebody on a retail theft because we don't know what else to do with them. I was working on some of the opioid settlement money, right? And we were talking about drug treatment. And one of the people in this meeting just said, "Well, I mean, if we put them in the jail, at least at least they're not at least they're not using again. Jails are not treatment facilities. We have to make sure that we are intentionally addressing substance abuse disorder and not just incarcerating people because that that doesn't treat the person, it doesn't help people, and it certainly certainly doesn't bring st the stability we need. So that's how these things that's how some of these things fit together. And I I think one of the interesting things is on the left here is to think about some of these direct referrals. Um, uh, I'd love to, you know, love to uh, make sure that we connect with, with, with all of these services. Many of these are easy to connect with. We have good relationship with our sheriff. Um, we're going to have great relationship with our parole, with our faith-based organizations, but I don't know that much yet about parole, right? I don't know that much about how we can take people from parole. Uh, it used to be called parole. Now it's called mandatory supervised release, but there's legislation sometimes that will connect that are, that it's going to build, they're called returning residents. That's going to build support for returning residents. We want to make sure they connect with the services when they return home to Lake County. So I'm, some of this is sort of the future and some of this is, are things that we can do uh, right now, but I, you might notice that law enforcement is there. And then it's the last thing I'll say before Sarah jumps up and talks about this important uh, important diagram. We have law enforcement buy-in in Lake County. We have the chiefs of the main areas buying into this. We had the mayors uh, signing uh, letters of support to get our grant funding. And all of our police chiefs are are bought into this process. They believe in this. And, and that's a great thing about, that's a great thing about Lake County. I know it may not be true everywhere, but uh, the police chiefs have bought into this. And obviously that leadership role, um, at least a few levels uh, down, uh, your deputy chiefs, your commanders uh, will will believe in this. I think most officers in the streets will believe in this, um, but we know we know that it's so important to have to have law enforcement buy in. So, um, yeah. So I don't know if you want to talk about the graphic. I do. Thanks. I just like to add a couple of things. Um, I can't st stress enough how important the law enforcement buy-in is, but we also need buy-in from all of the other players in Lake County and not just the people and organizations that fall into the categories that are on the left side of the graphic. We also need buy-in from residents of Lake County. And it's very important to, to remember when you're thinking about this, Lake County is purple. Okay. It is not blue. It is not red. It is politically purple. And so one of the really important goals of the gun violence prevention initiative is to win the hearts and minds of all of the residents of Lake County to help them understand that their safety, whether they live in a community of privilege or a community that's underserved depends on their neighbor's safety. Uh, so that uh, I'm going to get into in a little bit more detail in a minute. I'll just want to say another couple of words about the graphic. Um, if you can imagine, eventually this graphic will form a complete circle. Uh, it's un still under development. Um, the interruption piece, the restorative justice piece, connecting the violence interrupters to the services in Lake County, those are all 
top of mind, top priority, because that is where the problem is most severe and most urgent. And we all, no matter what part of the country we're living in, we should be focusing on ending gun violence in underserved communities, the kind that happens every day, because it feeds the violence everywhere, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Uh, but until, so what we are hoping for is if we do this right over the next five to 10 years, we're going to build all this out. Um, we're going to add a couple, we're going to add more modules on the left side here. Uh, we certainly intend to add a piece that focuses really clearly on uh, anti-recidivism efforts. Uh, but first, we need buy-in from parole, for example. Okay, we need buy-in from other community stakeholders. Uh, eventually, we want to have a section um, that's really focused on preventing firearm uh, suicide by firearm. Uh, because it is true that in the short run, we're primarily focused on ending violence in our underserved communities, but we are a gun viol a violence prevention office for all the residents of Lake County. So we eventually you'll see this built out and that please pay attention to the part that's in pink. Everything that is done will be based in trauma-informed practices. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I'll say about the graphic, uh, like I said earlier, this kind of work cannot be dependent on who happens to sit in the state's attorney's office and whether that person is a Democrat or a Republican or in favor of restorative justice or not. Uh, that's why eventually, if we do our jobs right, that section GVPI, the second, the black section in the middle, it'll just go away. And there'll be such a robust network of service providers um, that are fully supported by the residents with that, that, that the residents believe in, right? And then we won't need a state's attorney's office to be to be leading all of this anymore. That is the dream. So stay with us. Come along while we build the dream. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So can I do this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I said a few minutes ago. Everywhere in America, we should be prioritizing ending gun violence in underserved communities. That is where the most urgent problem lies. And the bulk of our resources, that's where we should be spending them, is ending it in our underserved communities. The reason is because when violence is high in underserved communities, that leads to violence everywhere. Um, and that's what this slide is about. What happened in Highland Park, which is in Lake County on July 4th, is a direct result of our failure to address everyday gun violence in underserved communities and its root causes. Remember, we don't wanna just put a Band-Aid on the problem. We wanna actually address the, the underlying causes. Next slide, please. I've been doing gun violence prevention work for almost seven years full time, and I've worked at the local, state, and federal levels. And I've met advocates from all over the country I've, met, I've worked with survivor advocates from all over the country, survivors of every conceivable type of gun violence. And what it has taught me is that it's all one problem, right? <laughs> and I'd like to make the connection for you now, when gun violence is high in underserved communities, that leads to gun violence everywhere. And the reason is because of the gun industry and the gun lobby. So if you start in the upper left corner of the, the graphic with me, the circle graphic, when gun violence is high in black and brown communities, the firearms industry uses racist marketing strategies to promote its products. One of the most one of the most popular assault style rifles on the market is called Urban Super Sniper. It's called that for a reason. Because it is racist and racism and fear sells guns. So the industry, we let them just run riot and practice whatever Reckless marketing techniques will allow them to sell more guns. We've allowed everybody, starting with our neighbors, our friends and neighbors in underserved communities, we've allowed the gun industry to trade their lives, their safety for their profits. And now it's affecting all of us because if the gun industry scares you or your neighbor into buying a gun or 20, then suddenly your community, no matter where you live, is awash in firearms. Now you have to worry if your child or grandchild is going to school with another child who has access to an unsecured firearm, who might be having a bad day, okay? <laughs> uh, and you have to lay awake and worry about that at night. And it all starts because we think somehow, those of us that live in communities of privilege, we think somehow that the gun violence that happens every day in Englewood, in Austin, in West Garfield Park, that somehow that's not our problem. It is our problem. And we, we have a role to play in stopping it. 
So that's what I mean when I say gun violence is not somebody else's problem, it's everybody's problem, and we must all work together to end it. We are doing that in Lake County. We are working together to end it. But we're not just putting Band-Aids on the problem. We're taking actual concrete steps to rebuild the broken communities that have been abandoned in so many ways. So that's what's at the root of all of this. And that's why I'll never stop <laughs> until uh, they drag me off the stage, I guess. So next slide. I'll let Eric, draw. oh, real quick. So this is just evidence backing up the points that I just made. Okay, so um, the couple of links there, they're embedded. I hope there's a way to sell these, share these slides with everybody listening. Um, there's a couple of links there. If you'd like to check any of the claims that I just made, please do, that's a good place to start. And with that, I'm gonna let Eric kick me off the stage and he'll take it from here. Next slide. So we, um, this is, uh, we, we started this work in uh, March of 2022, really before that. Uh, I have to tell this story because we do have Chris here. You know, Sarah and I uh, met in 2019 when I happened to be running for state's attorney and she introduced me to Chris. We went down to the Institute for Nonviolence uh, where Chris, was, I believe was the director. Yeah. Uh, and we learned, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot that day. It's still very, very clear in my mind with Sarah. And I remember asking, I think Chris, um, how many people does this, does the Institute for Nonviolence serve in its, in its violence prevention work? And, he, and I think he said about a hundred thousand, maybe 150,000. Um, and that's exactly the area that is most at risk in Lake County. Uh, that is our R3 zone. That is the area that's been identified where we want to reinvest uh, uh, funds. Uh, and, and that's exactly, that's about the size of the area that we were talking about in Lake County. And so that made me realize that this really was achievable in, in Lake County, even as we see these amazing programs in Chicago and in Cook County. And, and you think about the, the, the unbelievable work that's being done there. Lake County is just very different. And uh, I don't know how many of you live in Lake County. It's just very different. It's very different in terms, it's very different politically. It's very different legally. <clears throat> but it occurred uh, to me and, and to Sarah and, and many other people that we could do this in Lake County. So we started seeking uh, funding for it finally in March of 2022. Uh, we received ARPA funds in April of 2022. Uh, the uh, American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA funds. Uh, in 2022, uh, we received some money from the Illinois State Assembly, which was also their uh, uh, ARPA funds. And then finally, uh, very recently, we received $1.5 million in federal funds. But we know that this work will go on for a very long time. And we know that we have to continue to talk to private foundations, uh, as well as potentially maybe do our own fundraising, uh, which, is what, uh, which is what some of the groups do in Lake County regarding domestic violence, regarding uh, the opioid epidemic, and now, uh, the gun, now the gun violence problem in Lake County. And, and just to be clear, it is disproportionately affecting uh, men of color in Lake County. Lake County is only 7% African American, but 50% of our of our uh, murder victims uh, are black. And and so it is a it is an overwhelming problem uh, in uh, in Lake County, those disparities. And it really does show you the tall order that we have, but, uh, but we think that we're building something great. Uh, next slide, please. So what's next? Well, we have finally selected our fiscal agent, which is the Waukegan Township, and a 501c3 called the Coalition to Reduce Recidivism. We have uh, launching that CVI program. Uh, we are, have our hiring panels. Uh, we finally built all the contracts that we needed to build and uh, receive the insurance policies that we need to receive. And I know that may sound like a small thing, but I, it, it is something really important to think about how you build these, uh, build these programs. Uh, we are also obviously continuing to expand our, all of our alternative sentencing programs uh, for nonviolent offenses. That is primarily uh, on my office, but I'm doing everything I can to expand those. When I came in, 40% uh, uh, of the people facing felonies in Lake County uh, were black, 30% uh, were Latino. And there were under 10% uh, people of color in our diversion programs, under 10%. And now I'm very proud to say that our diversion programs match the population of people who are charged with felonies in Lake County. And that's very, very, it was one of the, frankly, frankly, when we look at all of the work, it was one of the easier things to fix because we had the wrong people making those decisions. We had 
disqualifiers that did not take into account uh, how the criminal justice system really works, which is that people take convictions early when they're young. It may not mean they go to jail or prison, but they take a conviction on their record. And then they are eliminated from a future diversion program 10, 15 years later. It doesn't matter if they're getting their commercial driver's license. It doesn't matter if they're going to lose their job or their housing. They will be eliminated from a diversion program uh, in Lake County. When I came into state attorney's office, we obviously eliminated those disqualifiers. And it was one of the easier things to do. Now, getting the judges to accept all of these people into diversion programs, that is harder. Uh, I we were putting people in the 20s. There were only about 20 people in the diversion programs before I got there. We've about tripled that, but I, we need to be in the hundreds, okay, when we look at the number of felonies that we're filing. So I'm working hard on it, but it was easy to eliminate the racial disparities. It has not been so easy to scale it way up, and that's that's something that I'm continuing to work on. And this work, I will say, and, and it has a lot to do uh, with Sarah, has an amazing amount to do with Sarah. I can't say enough about her, but we really have engaged our county board. We have engaged our other community leaders. We have engaged our state reps, our state senators. Um, Adrian Johnson and Rita Mayfield helped us get that money that I showed you. Congressman Brad Schneider helped us uh, get that money. And so we really have engaged our elected leaders to say, this is the way forward with gun violence prevention. We get to point to programs uh, uh, like Secretary Patterson's. We get to point to his office. We get to point to the governor's commitment. And you begin to feel real momentum uh, real momentum, not only in Chicago and Cook County, but but in Lake County. And we would love to see this moving in, moving into other collar counties, wherever wherever they may have uh, gun violence problems also. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll let Sarah, or, Sarah if you want to jump in. One, okay. one last comment on this slide. Um, the fourth item, which um, those of you in the room can't see because of the, the toolbar, uh, but that's community education and public awareness. Uh, I like to joke, but it's not really a joke with Eric when I say the only reason this office is not called the Office of Restorative Justice is because, to be perfectly honest, the work has not yet been done in Lake County to educate people about what restorative justice is and why it is a, a great approach to rebuilding broken communities and addressing the inequities in our criminal justice system. Uh, so um, <laughs> Uh, with with long term goal in mind of winning the hearts and minds of all Lake County residents and winning them over to the idea of restorative justice practices, uh, we have um, a Harvard research team on our gun violence prevention initiative staff. Um, they're not paid, but <laughs> they're gen they're generously doing it um, free of charge. But uh, they uh, have th they have t undertaken a research project to really start to get a sense of what people think of restorative justice in Lake County. Uh, they've held they were just here um, a couple of weeks ago holding focus groups in both our underserved and fully served communities. And uh, we don't we don't have the full results yet, but we're incredibly encouraged because the anecdotal evidence coming out of those focus groups is a remarkable amount of support for restorative justice in Lake County from all types of communities once it, we explain to people what it is. There's just a clear misunderstanding of what restorative justice is. So again, I'm sort of my role here tonight to talk about the long-term goals of the Gun Violence Prevention Initiative, and that's where um, that's where we'll be pursuing that long-term goal is uh, through those community education and public awareness events. Next slide. Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably, uh, I think we've sort of talked about a lot of this um, we've, t I think probably because I spoke and was thinking about this slide that, that Sarah and I wrote, um, but you sort of can think back to the graph, uh, and as you read this and yeah, I think, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. We, we have a new, uh, juvenile justice council, uh, which I'm very proud of, uh, in the office, uh, to ensure, uh, that we are thinking really holistically about where and, and why and how, uh, juveniles are committing crime. Uh, not just gun violence. And, and so obviously, though, there's going to be overlap. And so I'm really proud of the Juvenile Justice Council work, uh, but also our regional superintendent of schools um, is uh, joining with us with through his own grant uh, to address the school to prison pipeline. And then finally, I'm really excited about this. Uh, and this is also credit to Sarah's connections. Uh, we're also partnering with Condell's Level One Trauma Center in Libertyville and uh, Gurney. Uh, to train violence interrupters and others uh, regarding what to do when we make those hospital connections. Uh, because I probably uh, don't need to say this, it's probably obvious to many of you, but just because there is a shooting doesn't mean that there's a case in my office. 
And uh, that's really important. And probably we have not talked enough about data, by the way. Uh, we need to add that to our uh, add that to our presentation. But um, just because there's a case or just because there's a shooting doesn't mean that prosecutors are automatically involved. Uh, there can be a shooting, uh, and we hope, you know, frankly, people don't have to go to the hospital either. But we hope that 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 there can be a connection made at the hospital also. And so uh, we only have one. Uh, we only have one. Uh, level one trauma center in Lake County, but they are a, a big partner. Uh, there's an amazing doctor there uh, named uh, Dr. Akbarnia, who really sort of sought us out and, and who Sarah had met and said that she wanted to help us. So their, their trauma team is going to connect with our violence interrupters. Yes, and something you can't see here, um, that in this whole space, we want to think about um, a root cause of gun violence as being abuse. And I, I, I heard a phrase yesterday that I said, Sarah, we got to add this, uh, which is ending the abuse to prison pipeline. We've heard of the school to prison pipeline, but the abuse to prison pipeline, I thought was a really, a really good, um, a good turn of phrase. And, and that's something that we are going to uh, seek assistance from with our, with our friends at Advocate. So uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about this slide. Next slide. I think we're about done here. We can get to questions. Yeah. Yeah. So this is sort of a summary. I don't know if you'd take it. Do some summary work. So this is really focusing on um, how the legal system uh, in the short run uh, is really going to, to make changes to the GVPI. We plan to increase treatment for first-time offenders who take responsibility for their crimes through the Domestic Violence Prevention Program. Uh, we're expanding the number, I shouldn't say we, it's State's Attorney Reinhardt, uh, is expanding the number of attorneys in the Rehabilitative Services Division to uh, expand admissions into diversion and specialty court programs. Um, I know, I don't think it's in the works yet, but we we dream of a gun court, for example. Um, it's way past time for that in Lake County. Uh, we uh, will be addressing the problem or are addressing the problem of underrepresentation of defendants of color and felony diversion programs. State's Attorney Reinhardt already talked about that a bit tonight, um, and expanding the total number of defendants in all diversion programs. For anybody who's kind of new to this topic tonight, um, deflection, uh, that means alternatives to arrest. Diversion means in alternatives to incarceration. So some pretty key terms there if you're trying to educate yourself about this issue. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can there's, talk data, about the data. there's data. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we think, that, uh, we think that data is key to all of this um, because we still are doing the work, as Sarah said, it is, uh, it is purple in Lake County and the um, powers that be in our legal system um, um, sometimes make things go slower. Uh, and so there is still work to be done. And why is data so important? Well, data is important for two reasons. Uh, and the first reason might depend on where you live and the the, bat the battles that you're fighting. Uh, the first reason that that uh, that data is important is because unfortunately there's still persuasion to be done. Um, we had a presentation today about racial disparities. The National Academy of Sciences just re released a 400-page book about disparities in our uh, in our legal system. And um, I had every prosecutor watch that presentation today by the Joyce Foundation. They're amazing. And I printed out copies of that book, uh, only a few copies, but we're going to put them on every floor because the racial disparities in our justice system are still something that I think people need to be convinced about. Maybe nobody in this room, maybe nobody listening to my voice. I'll just say there are people out there that still need to be convinced that there are racial disparities in our justice system nationally and locally. And when I say locally, I mean Lake County. And so that's why data is important. The second reason data is important is because you have to test your methods. You have to test what you're, whether what you're doing is working. And if you don't have fast data, if you don't have up-to-date data, then you don't know whether what you're doing is working. That example is obvious from the diversion story I told about the disqualifiers. And so um, this is really what our office is doing um, to to contribute to that to that blue to that blue part of the part of the graph. Um, I've talked about diversion. I've talked about data. And we've also, I'm very proud that we have a, a mental health deflection program called the Living Room Wellness Center, where we get people who are in crisis uh, out of the jails and out of the emergency rooms to mental health professionals. And we think that's an important, an important part of, uh, of this total story. Next slide. That's it. You can end on that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Just more examples. Um, I'm not going to go through this one word for word. Um, I think this might be the last slide. Can you jump ahead just so I can confirm that? Okay, yeah. Okay, Bob. Um, yeah, I think we can. This is just a, sort of a summary of what we've been talking about. So next slide, final slide, please. So I'm going to give uh, Eric the last word. Um, we're really hopeful that 
folks will have some questions. We'd really love to answer them. I'm going to give Eric the last word, but I'm going to share my last word right now. Um, and I have a message specifically for anyone listening who is from a community of privilege, uh, like myself. Um, what I really want people to understand that are sort of in the habit of thinking of the gun violence problem as someone else's problem. It's the kind of thing that happens in another community, not in my community. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people are starting to realize it could happen anywhere. Uh, but what I want people of privilege to understand is what some of the leaders in this room tonight um, taught me many years ago, which is the assault weapons ban although it was a wonderful victory for the gun violence prevention movement, and I am delighted that it has been signed into law by Governor Pritzker, it will not end gun violence. It won't end gun violence anywhere, not even in communities of privilege, until we do what we've talked about here tonight, until we don't just put a Band-Aid on the problem of gun violence, but we actually work to address its root causes and rebuild um, our broken communities. It took decades for our communities to become broken. It took the impact of generations of systemic racism and the building of, of systemically racist institutions. It's going to take time to rebuild those communities. But what it's way past time from pe for people from communities like mine to understand is that that's our job, okay? That's our job, right? We, and, and when we do that job, when we rebuild our broken communities, we're making ourselves and our own children and grandchildren safer because we're, we all have the same problem. And if you think that the assault weapons ban because you live in a community of privilege means you don't have to worry about gun violence anymore, then I'm sorry, you just don't see the big picture. So we invite everybody to, to learn more, to join us, um, to support reformers everywhere, like State's Attorney Reinhardt, um, and, and join with us, learn about how you can help co contribute no matter where you live. Um, and thank you so much for, for giving us a chance to speak tonight. Eric, do you wanna wrap it up? So, nope, that's okay, I'll just ask a question. <laughs> okay. I, I cannot top that, so. Thank you. Feeling they're gonna wanna ask you questions. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> The question was fantastic and was how much kickback did I get when I became, when I started now, do you mean like overall, or do you mean with gun violence prevention? You mean like overall kind of, yeah. <clears throat> On a scale of one to 10. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think people, my, my career was as a defense attorney. Uh, so I spent 20 years as a defense attorney uh, before I raised my hand to be state's attorney. I'm very proud to say that the second before I raised my hand to be a state's attorney, I was, always, I was a public defender uh, and I had my own private practice, but we, I was very proud that we had public defender cases too. So I bring, you know, I hope I bring a perspective of, of, of seeing a lot of sides of, of seeing um, the, uh, of seeing everyone as a person. I think that's really one of the jobs of the defense attorney is to present your client as a person. And so the things that I learned in that, in that job, uh, almost entirely in Lake County uh, was, you know, how to, how to fight for people. And now I just have a lot more clients than I did before. And uh, my job is to fight for everyone in Lake County and to think, think as strategically and as broadly as, and as innovatively and as urgently and as aggressively as we can uh, about all of these problems. So um, yeah, there's, there, there has been a lot of pushback, but there's been so much support. I, I got to Can I say this real quick? I love doing jury trials. What do we do? With, what are juries? Why are juries so important? Because we take people from outside the courthouse and we bring them into the courthouse and we say, we're not going to just, you know, we're not going to rely on repeat actors. We're not going to rely on, on alliances and people who know each other and people who are tired of each other. We bring juries into the courthouse and we let them decide important things. I've had a lot of pushback, but I have had so much support from people outside the courthouse. And if we can take the entire community and the entire, the entire civic society and pour it into our legal system the way we do with a jury, I think we're going to see a lot better results. So yeah, I've had some pushback, but I've also had some amazing support from CBOs, from government people who didn't know they were interested in the justice system. Uh, frankly, people who you know saw the saw the George Floyd murder on TV and knew we needed to do more. That was in uh, in May of, I think May of 2020, um, uh, maybe it was July, I apologize. Um, it was in the summer of 2020 and you know my election uh, happened to be in November. So, so I've gotten 
but I've also gotten more. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I've gotten more support than I, than I expected to. Well, I told them all that we should um, think about getting rid of cash bail, and many of them disagreed with me. Um, no, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm a former teacher, so it just like when something important gets said, and I know that there are probably people listening who are missing key background information. The reason he said that is because the Safety Act, ending cash bail, ending prison gerrymandering, uh, reforming uh, police uh, law enforcement practices, there's policies for for stopping people. Uh, all those things are gun violence prevention. And what's so great is that Eric Reinhardt gets that, right? Uh, so Betty asked earlier, you know, what is your pushback? Well, I've been watching him from, from the sidelines. His Most of his pushback has been for his support for the Safety Act, right? Uh, but, but that's because we haven't done the work to explain to people that ending cash bail rebuilds our broken communities, which if we keep doing that in broken communities everywhere, then guess what? My privileged community is going to be safer too, because people will buy fewer guns. Uh, it's all connected. And until we realize that, we're just going to keep putting band-aids on the problem and going around and around in circles. I'm sorry. No, Go that's ahead. okay. No, I have reached out. I have reached out to some state's attorneys to talk about this. The I have amazing partnerships with I have amazing partnerships with the neighboring states attorneys on a lot of different topics. Um I know State Attorney Fox is dedicated to restorative justice and to, and to many of these ideas. And 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 frankly, you know, she doesn't necessarily have to bring in the funding and the the sort of support that we need in in Lake County. And 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 she has you know other other struggles. But um, the state's attorneys in the other collar counties, um, I've had a great relationship with on a lot of topics. The Safety Act. Um, I, I don't want to say like broke the relationships, but it made the relationships more difficult. And so um, we need to get through that. We need to figure out what we're going to do. Um, it's always been very professional and courteous and something like this. Uh, I would love for them to, to, to take to their, take to their other, to their counties. Yeah. There's a woman in the back in red. Sure. The question was, what's the definition of restorative justice? So the definition of restorative justice is treating the, really the the entire individual. Um, we have an individual who has we have an individual who has committed a crime, or has been accused of committing a crime. We have an individual who has been harmed uh, by the crime, and it's to think about what makes um, what makes the uh, survivor whole. It's to think about what makes the defendant um, as whole as possible while also protecting the community, and it's to uh, think about what is best for the community. It's to go beyond simply reacting or making it a math problem of, well, the guy got five years in prison, so now he needs seven. Well, he got five years in prison 20 years ago, and now he has three kids and he's working on his uh, commercial driver's license. And so, yeah, he got five years, he got, he got prison five, he got prison, he got five years in prison 20 years ago, but that doesn't mean that we can't support him for his nonviolent offense now. And I will tell you, that is not how a lot of prosecutors and judges look at it. They say, if you got five years, will you need at least six? Because five didn't work. And so we have to always move up. And so restorative justice is to look at the look at the entire person. It's to look at the entire situation. It's to look at the entire community. But I don't mind saying that it is also really important that we listen to survivors of color, that we listen to victims of color. When um, when we say that Black Lives Matter, we don't only mean people who have a right not to be racially profiled, but that victims of color also have a right to have their voice heard in our courthouse. It is both sides of that. And I think that um, many uh, victims of color are neglected in our legal system. I think that can be a very hard thing to count also. Uh, that can be a very hard thing to get data about. Uh, but it's something that I am I am very aware of. And so restorative justice is to think about all of these programs in new ways uh, and to use um, to make sure that we are using up-to-date methods, social science to think about the problems and not simply not simply do what we've done in the past and expect expect better results. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, the question was really great question. How do we how do we deal with the um, economic pressure that a that a conviction can create, whether it's probation service fees, whether it's just regular court fines, whether it's regular court fees, 
Um, so one of the things that I did as state's attorney was I, we do not file petitions to revoke people's probation based on money. We, we might if they committed a new offense while they were on probation, but not based on money. Um, and that was a new that was a new practice. Um, we I think we just have to be intentional about that and, and thinking about the money. Um, I have heard of systems that um, find people differently based on you know how much money they make. Um, generally, that is true. There it has been historically true that public defender clients, for example, will have lower will have lower fines. Um, so there's there's some there's some work being done with that. Um, but I think that's something that a prosecutor's office um, can just say, we're not going to ask to revoke people's probation over money, but the money, the money is still being owed, right? The, the courts do enter judgment on that. There have been some improvements from the legislature. Um, I, I believe that, um, I, I believe some of the, some very recently have tried to reduce some of these fines and costs and tried to make sure that it is not having such an impact on people's civil, uh, uh, people's uh, credit history and their and their credit store, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I will, I just have to say this: when you post bond right now, because the Safety Act is um, stayed, um, is paused. When you post bond right now on one case, they will take the money that you posted on this case and pay all your old fines and costs, and they just do that automatically. So that bond money is now taken away, even if the individual ends up winning their case and and the money is released. So there's a lot more to be done with the economic aspect of this. Um, obviously removing cash bail is a big piece of it, but it's not the only piece. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, every the, the approach that you've learned about here today was inspired by several of the people in this room right now. Chris Patterson, Cedric Bryson, Delphine Cherry. I haven't known Sean Long for, but I know he's doing similar work. Um, what, if, if this is new issue to you and you're just beginning to learn about violence interrupters and how they're saving lives every day, whether you're aware that they're out there or not, I'd love to tell a quick story. Um, the very first organization violence interruption program that I got affiliate or that I got familiar with was the one Eric mentioned earlier that Secretary Patterson used to be the director of the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago. And I remember five, six years ago when I would go out there to visit and I just really wanted to learn more. And I remember I would have to, to go home to my home in the suburbs, I would have to drive through Oak Park. And at the time, the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago was located, um, what's that main street that goes right into, on Chicago Avenue, literally one mile straight east of the Frank Lloyd Wright home. And I was so struck by the fact that, you know, as I drove home, I drive one mile straight west and I'm passing six, seven, eight million dollar homes. And the people in Oak Park were safer because of the work that the violence interrupters were doing without guns, without bulletproof vests to keep them safe. And those people in those million dollar homes didn't even know that the Institute for Nonviolence existed, just one mile away, right? And that's not acceptable, all right? Uh, which is why th that, that whole realization just sort of launched me on this path. And um, so thank you for what you said, but really the inspiration is not mine, it's the people in this room and, and the thousands of people across this country um, that put their lives online every day to save lives. And we don't even know they're there. And it's about time we start noticing them. And supporting them <laughs> with laws and money. <laughs> Lots of other things, cookies. <laughs> And with that, we're, we'll sort of close our presentation. I apologize to everyone for any technical difficulties that encountered early on, um, and especially a big thank you to both of our speakers. I know, you know, I I've walk, I walk away with this like feeling incredibly inspired, and I look forward to more connections with them and other organizations to sort of bring a lot of this knowledge and advocacy and action to work that you know League of Women Voters does and other orgs across not just Chicago but Illinois. Um, just a little side note, I actually, you know, I have two people or, or two families in my life that have been impacted by mass shooters to, you know, years and years apart. One, um, one was in uh, Sandy Hook and the other was in Highland Park. And as being a young person in the in the world, like to sort of already know that I've known 
multiple people in this situation, it's only going to get worse. And I know there's tons of people across Chicago in this country that know multiple people affected by gun violence. So it's really important to sort of get the word out about this sort of work and to get involved because as Sarah and Eric both um, kept mentioning, this is a problem for everyone. And no matter whether you're affected or not, everyone should care about what's happening here. So, you know, to learn more information, um, I will be linking this to our league website, the presentation with their permission um, to, you know, get more information. And we will also be um, available both after the program for a bit and also um, digitally to continue these sorts of conversations and get people involved. So I appreciate everyone taking time this evening and have a great rest of your evening. And for those of you who live in Chicago, we have an election coming up next week. So one week from today, don't forget to vote or early vote before then or vote by mail or anything. Uh, we definitely need to get out and vote, not just you know on uh, gun violence situations in Chicago, but multiple issues that are affecting Chicago. So just vote, 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 vote. All right, have a good night, everybody.